feature Professor um, Douglas Christie in one of his last LA appearances before he disappears to Argentina for a couple of years. And tonight, Professor Christie will be presenting his work, The Blue Sapphire of the Mind, Notes for a Contemplative Ecology, in conversation with Professor Ruben Martinez, Fletcher Jones Chair of Literature and Writing here at LMU, who you may have seen here as a part of this very series last semester, since he was a featured pub night speaker for his book, Desert America. So I'm delighted to welcome Ruben and Doug, and Ruben is going to provide us with a more thorough introduction to his friend and colleague. Thanks. Thanks, Jamie. Welcome, everybody. <laughs> with which we are received in, this, in the Bondurar suite, um, and um, uh, it's, it's, it's an honor. Uh, Douglas, um, <laughs> Christy, I was going to say Doug, because um, uh, I consider Doug a friend, but this is a more formal occasion, so I, I will call him Douglas today. Uh, Douglas uh, uh, asked me to uh, serve um, as interlocutor uh, uh, today here, uh, and it's an honor. So it's, it's a very special occasion. Um, this amazing tome, with the beautiful artwork and the mind-bending title, <laughs> The Blue Sapphire of the Mind, Notes for Contemplative Ecology, it's an it's a, it's a, uh, occasion for celebration. A tremendous amount of work went into this, and uh, he'll be reading from it in a little bit. So I just I prepared a, a, a short friendly, uh, introduction grew up between the Pacific Northwest and Southern California, the Santa Ana winds and the redwoods, between Mount Rainier and the LA River trapped in concrete. He had his first taste of contemplative life at the monastery of Our Lady of Clairvaux near Vina in the San Joaquin Valley, where he began the journey that made this book possible. That journey took him across much time and much space to the fourth century, to the Egyptian desert, to the sometimes sublime, sometimes fearful places where the spirit resides, the desert within and the desert out there. I've had the privilege of learning much from Douglas because I was in his class. <laughs> and he was in mine. <laughs> we taught, team taught a course together called uh, Into the Desert, which began as a friendly argument over a cup of coffee in the youth hall. Mm -hmm. This book is the result of many years, many years, of ruminating. This is one of Douglas's favorite words. <laughs> in Latin, he never tires of telling us, it's ruminatio. <laughs> Literally, to chew over. Yes, like chewing the cud. The cud being the big questions. What does it mean to inhabit this planet now? <clears throat> Is ecology also a spiritual concern? Are spiritual struggles also ecological ones? This work is an ambitious, sweeping undertaking. It is Douglas's unified field theory. It is a work of healing for a broken world. We are feeling that brokenness in a particular way today, given the tragedy in Boston. The work that this book represents is urgent. It is work that all of us, in one way or another, perform, ruminating over life itself, our place in the world, among the many others. Please welcome Douglas Christie.
we're feeling so kind of, this is, a, this is kind of a going away party too, because we're going to be gone pretty soon to Argentina, and um, oh, let's make some more food. So we made a bunch of other food, and we brought it, so it's over there. <laughs> he, barbecued, he barbecued the chicken. Right, right, right. And, uh, and so, you know, I'll consider it a compliment if um, uh, at any moment during the next 40 minutes or so, you feel moved to get up and wander over and, and, and have some more food. This will be, this will be good. And um, uh, thank you especially to the students who are here. Um, some of you may be here willingly, some of you may be here um, because you've been encouraged to be here. I, I, I understand that you've got plenty on your plates right now with um, the end of the semester coming, and I, I'm, I'm really glad you're here. Um, and thanks to my friends who came out and my students that I believe we're turning with this semester. So thank you, um, everybody, for coming out. Oh, and Adam and Bennett and Jennifer, of course. Thank Yay! you. <laughs> yeah, and they've seen this thing laying around the house. And um, <laughs> other books have called to them more deeply. <laughs> um, but, but there it is anyway. So thank, thank you for coming. Um, well, I, I think just to kind of give you a sense of how, how long you'll be captive and, and what we're going to do here, I, I just want to say a couple words regarding the context, where this book came from, what it's about for me. Um, I'm going to ask you to indulge me uh, as I read a little morsel from the book. There go the first <laughs> on, on uh, second helping. Going the way. Um, <laughs> And I can't say for sure, one way or another, but it may happen in the next 25, 30 minutes that little remote control helicopters <laughs> are over there. So just be, be, be able to look out for that. Um, and then uh, Ruben and I are going to have a little conversation about the book and, and, and a conversation with you as well, I hope. So, um, so um, Lainey Beauvais is here this evening. Uh, thank you for coming, Lainey. And Lainey, you expressed what not a few people have expressed when they actually laid eyes on this book. Um, Did you have to use so many words? <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, it's, it's big. It's thick. It's, um, you know, so, okay, I, that's true. That is the first impression one has. And I probably didn't have to use so many words. I don't know. The words that I felt the need to use are in here. But um, it is true, and another friend here tonight, um, Kennedy Wheatley, asked me how long you've been working on this, and it's, it might be kind of scary for someone to hear that um, I first started thinking about the ideas in this book 20 years ago, and I think students often find this kind of time frame a little bewildering, like, <laughs> you've got a week or 10 days at the end of the semester, crank out two or three papers, and it's a lot of time, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and so what yeah. the heck, you know? Um, I didn't spend all my waking hours the last 20 years working on this, but Ruben's right. What's in this book had to kind of uh, come to fruition over a long time, and I can't account for that except to say that it, it took until last year for it to take shape in the form that it has. And but that does say something about how much of me and my my own deepest commitments and values and longings are, are in the pages of this book. And so, um, you know, when Ruben referred to how much is broken, um, that's not the only theme of this book. I, I, I hope that anybody who picks up this book or even looks at the cover and see this <coughs> wonderful painting by Arthur Dove, which he whimsically entitled Me and the Moon, just a little, 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 you know, love story right there, will feel the beauty that's in this book and in the world. I hope that some of that can come <coughs> through, but you can't write about the world, the natural world, at this moment in history without feeling its fragmented character our own fragmentation, and not only in relation to the natural world, but social fragmentation, what happened in Boston the other day. There's so much brokenness. And so the book is about the possibility of healing. It raises questions about whether we still have the capacity to live in a way that allows us to honor the living world, one another, our own deepest sense of, of who God is, who the divine is in our lives. And I, I, I hope at the end of the day somebody who looks at this book or reads it will feel that it's a hopeful book, that it's a 
about the possibility of renewing our own deepest commitments. That's <coughs> what moved me to write it, and that's what, uh, what, what, it, what I think it's fundamentally about. Okay, the blue sapphire of the mind. Special door prize <laughs> for anybody who, who, who could kind of take a guess as to what, uh, except for Charlotte Rather, uh, <laughs> what that could be about. And, you know, would you really consider buying or reading a book called The Blue Sapphire of the Mind? What is that about? Um, the Blue Sapphire of the Mind is a phrase, actually, that was coined by a fourth century Christian monastic figure named Evagrius of Pontus. He's, there were a lot of strange desert dwellers in the early fourth century. It's one of the most interesting movements in early Christianity. There was a social, economic, political crisis in the late antique world, and some human beings, men and women, uh, responded by withdrawing onto the edges of society and trying to reconstitute human community uh, through a, a, a deep spiritual practice. Monasticism is what it came to be called. Evagrius of Pontus has, is, is one of the more unusual of these characters. He's been called the most Buddhist of the early Christian monks. It doesn't mean he was a Buddhist. It just means that he felt like everything we say about God has to eventually be unsaid because it falls so short of who God actually is. And so the blue sapphire of the mind is this image that he conjured up out of his own meditative practice to suggest what can, in fact, happen to us, in us, when we become purified, when we find a way to, 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 to let go of all <coughs> the things that keep us imprisoned, <coughs> our fears, our pathologies, our, our uh, anxieties. And he said that the mind born of grace that is to say, the mind completely renewed and made whole is, is illuminated as if with blue sapphire. It, it, it shines and radiates forth with that same purity of blue sapphire. So he's pointing toward capacity that he thinks we all have for a luminous consciousness of the whole. God, other, world. Now the monks weren't um, naive. I would say they weren't even that optimistic. They had a pretty healthy understanding of how broken we are and how much our brokenness contributes to the world. But precisely what drew me to engage <coughs> these figures was their sense of possibility of renewal. That if we, if we enter into a deep spiritual practice and face what they spoke of in terms of the demons, we can be remade and renewed, and the world can be remade and renewed through our own renewal. So, um, last thing I'll say, and then I'll just I'll stop there. Um, what's ecological about that? Well, the monks weren't into ecology. There was no such thing as ecology. But they did have a vision of the whole that in our own time, scientific age, we've come to think of often in terms of ecology, the, the, the science of the, the way of understanding how various beings interact with and interpenetrate with other living beings and other living systems, a vision of the whole. For the early monks, it was a spiritual vision and a way of living that allowed one to feel connected to the whole and, and, and uh, creating a community that had a, a, a sort of a holism integrity. What we're facing now uh, with the advent of, of the, 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 the modern science of ecology is the challenge of understanding ourselves in relation to every other living organism that exists as part of a whole vision. Human society in relation to other living beings, our own obligation to tend to them, to, to be in relationship with them. So this book, which I think if you can say, if you want to say nothing else about it, you can say it's just a little bit idiosyncratic, um, argues that these spiritual practices and teachings from 
early Christian monasticism have everything to do with the work that we're trying to do in the early 21st century to re-knit the, the, the broken world into something whole. So contemplative ecology is a, a phrase meant to suggest that the work of re-knitting the world is a, is a deeply spiritual practice that each of us has to engage in and that communities have to find a way of engaging in with one another. So that could either have helped illuminate what the blue sapphire of the vibe is or, or, or further obscured it. But um, so w just one other little thing I want to do now is um, I, I want to read a, a little section. And um, I'll just set it up by saying that um, uh, Every summer for the last 20 years, maybe, I've been uh, spending a month uh, in a place called the Sinkion Wilderness. It's uh, five hours north of San Francisco, up Highway 101, and then you get to the beautiful metropolis of Garberville, <laughs> and then you go west <coughs> to a place called the Lost Coast, where the Sinkion Wilderness, and the roads get narrower and uh, more full of potholes until you run out of pavement altogether and you reach this place called Four Corners and then you descend on a, a death-defying single track dirt road for about three miles until you uh, amazingly emerge out in this almost pristine wilderness uh, that's been uh, preserved as a state park and um, we, st we stay there in this little nice <coughs> ranch house and um, we, we supposedly have a job, which is to tend to the place, but um, I can honestly say it's not that hard of a job. <laughs> and, um, and what it does, what it has done though, is, is it's given us a month, more or less, every summer to um, kind of uh, enter into a different sort of rhythm in relationship to the world. And um, all that time I've been living in LA, so I have the experience of kind of withdraw and then return and I don't ever kind of deny my life here for the sake of the great pristine wilderness but th they've become part of one another in my own experience and what I'm going to read to you now is a little um, excerpt from uh, that kind of um, time in the wilderness and the other thing worth noting is there's a monastery up there, Redwood Monastery we've become friends with the community of Trappist nuns who live in the Redwood Forest in this very ancient uh, way and um, part of what happens when we're there is we're down in the Lost Coast, no cell phone, no electricity, uh, pretty much cut off from civilization as we know it. And once a week or so, we'll head back up that little dirt road and go to the monastery and see our friends and, and enter into the rhythm of um, monastic silence. So this is a little description of that. <coughs> um, and I guess what I'm kind of getting at here is that these um, these different ways of being in the world uh, have something to do with one another. So, uh, here's a, here are a couple of little epigraphs. Um, the first one is from Maximus the Confessor, who says, Perfect silence alone proclaims God. And the second is um, what is the best I can do to give you a sense of what a white crowned sparrow sounds like. Um, if there are any birders here, you know that um, bird books will give you a um, description of the bird, what it looks like in the wild, how to identify it, and then sometimes they'll write out mm -hmm. what the bird sounds like in <laughs> letters. <laughs> so the, the second epigraph is um, C siddle siddle tee 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 teaser. <laughs> I thought the white crowned sparrow deserved place here, along with everybody else, so, you know. It's been over 25 years since I first encountered the remote, wild place on the northern California coast, known as the Sinkion Wilderness. I was spending a week at Redwoods Monastery and decided to braid the steep, narrow, winding road that led down to the bluff overlooking the Pacific Ocean. That particular day, the entire coast was shrouded in a thick fog. I could hardly see anything, only the muted outlines of trees and shrubs and the swirling movement of the mist itself. I stood there a long while feeling a strange wonder 
of being utterly immersed inside that thick, dense world of cloud. Gradually, I began to notice the sounds of the place, the rhythmic pulse of waves pounding against the cliffs, gulls crying, then the faint, sweet sound of bird song, rising and falling, rising and falling, rising and falling. What creature was this? I had no idea. For the next few hours, I wandered through the fields and along the cliff's edge. Eventually, the cold cutting through me, I made myself move from that spot and began my journey back up the road to the monastery. It was some years before I returned to the St. Leon Wilderness. This time, I had come to live for a month in the old 1920s ranch house that serves as the visitor center. <coughs> After unpacking my bags, I walked again out into the field where I had stood before amidst the fog and bird song. On this day, it was bright and clear, the ocean luminous, the grass field like burnt gold, the swallows circling overhead, moving back and forth from the field to their mud nests against the house, a raft of pelicans gliding out over the water, turns and diving. Once again, I was entering into the life of that place. Then I heard it, the faint sound of bird song. Once, twice, third time. I was only just beginning to notice birds at the time and still could not easily identify them in the field, either by song or by appearance. But the song of this particular bird delighted me, and I learned to recognize it early on during my stay at the St. Leon. Later, with the help of a field guide, I discovered its name, Zonotrichia leucophis, of the white-crowned sparrow. In the world of birders, the song of this particular bird is thought to be unremarkable. As one commentator notes disparagingly of its insistent, even repetitious song, here is a bird that seems determined that we remember its song. <laughs> <laughs> I never felt that way, nor did I feel drawn to compare this particular bird's song with that of any others, though I eventually came to cherish the songs of the western meadowlark, the mockingbird, and the canyon wren, among others. I came to love it simply because it inhabited this particular place, a place that over the next 20 years became so important to me. Its simple, lilting song, rendered in Sibley's Guide to Birds, all together now. <laughs> gradually became a familiar and recognizable part of the music of the place in particular of the field that ran down from the old ranch house to the cliff above the ocean. I spent many long hours in that field stretched out on the limbs of an old bleached eucalyptus tree, gazing up at the sky or out over the ocean, doing nothing in particular, simply attending to the presence of the life around me. Always I would hear the song of the sparrow <coughs> rising up out of the stillness, then the crashing waves below, the wind in the grass, then again, that sweet song. It is only now as I reflect on this encounter that I realize how deeply the wild beauty of that song touched me. Here was this tiny being alive in the world, singing endlessly, it seemed, its distinctive song, giving voice to the life of that particular place. And I was alive inside it, listening. This little story while holding real importance for me, might otherwise seem hardly worth relating. It is, after all, simply a story of learning to notice and listen to a wild being in the natural world, not even a rare or endangered being, but a very ordinary one. Still, it touches on a question that for me is of central importance, especially here. Namely, what does it mean to learn how to listen? And why does it seem to be so difficult to cultivate the habit of deep listening that is at the heart of contemplative practice and of any sustained effort to attend to the life of the world. Perhaps to address these questions, it will help to step back a little from the story and say something about the larger context in which it unfolds. This requires returning to the monastery. I came to the St. Leon Wilderness from Redwoods Monastery. This was the threshold across which I initially passed to enter this wild place. And during my stays at, Saint, at the St. Leon, I regularly returned to the monastery, traveling up the road to sit in that space of silence, to join the community for meditation and prayer and song, to cook with them, 
to share a meal. Then after a time, I would descend again down that narrow, twisting road to the coast, to the little cabin, to the field overlooking the ocean. This movement from monastery to wilderness and back again became a central part of the rhythm of my life in that place. Learning to live into this rhythm, as I understand now, helped m initiate me into the practice of listening, of attending to the word that arises out of the silence, out of sacred texts, out of the life of wild beings and places. Whether at the monastery or down at the coast, I gradually came to see this practice of contemplative attention as arising out of a common concern, desire to find a deeper sense of intimacy between word and world. Okay, I'll stop there. Um, so, um, I'm going to just uh, invite Ruben to, to enter in now, and we'll engage one another, and we'll engage all of you. Uh, and, and, and what I hope, among other things, is that the questions and concerns you have about what it means to inhabit the world and a broken, fragmented world in need of healing at this moment in time, what, what your concerns are, that, that can become part of our conversation as well. Um, it is a common work, and I'm interested in, in your responses and your insight. So, and Ruben. Yes, uh, I, I, um, thank you for reading that, that wonderful excerpt. Um, I wanted to note the, you all heard it, the great lyricism with which uh, Douglas approaches writing a place, uh, a natural place, um, uh, and uh, um, uh, also in terms of the intimacy between word and world, as you put it, um, creating this bridge, uh, or rather bridges, between realms that have become uh, separate, that have become fragmented. And that is really one of the, the, the central concerns of, of, of the book. So I, I wanted to ask you, at what point in your ruminating, in your contemplating, being attentive to both uh, the natural world and the world of spirit, and here I'm separating them by calling them separate, right? Pointing out uh, division between them. At, at what point did these really start to come together for you in your work and in, and, and in, your, new, in your life? Uh, because ultimately that is, a, 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 you're asking us to uh, inhabit these realms simultaneously, indeed to, to not, uh, to, to hear in the, the song of the bird, the song of the spirit, right? At the same time. Um, and many radical environmentalists have not had a lot of time for the realm of the spirit. And many contemplatives have not had a lot of time to hang out with birders. <laughs> so how, at what point did this, this door into this, this, this integrative realm open up for you? Question, well, Ruben, <laughs> uh, I, I have to go back to my early days as an altar boy. Uh, <laughs> seriously, I, I um, I don't know if this phrase will mean anything to anyone here, but I, I think it's probably fair to say that I'm a, I'm a, I'm a recovering dualist. <laughs> I'm a recovering person who habitually uh, fell into this kind of pattern of separating things from each other uh, in an artificial way, in exactly the way that you described. And I mentioned being an altar boy. Um, uh, anybody here ever? An altar boy or altar girl? Or mm -hmm. Yes, okay. <laughs> the, the, there's a great step forward post Vatican II that <laughs> young women were allowed to serve in this way. Um, um, so <coughs> I mentioned that because um, I, I did, I mean, I, I, I did serve as an altar boy when I was younger, and it was a little bit of an awe inspiring experience for me, uh, even if I wasn't always uh, fully attentive uh, to what was going on uh, before me. Um, I don't want to overstate how pious I was. It was just something that I guess one of the nuns asked me to do, and then there I was doing it. And um, I eventually got kicked out for bad behavior as well. <laughs> <laughs> but, 
<laughs> but, um, but while I was doing it, so there I'm holding before you are, and it's been, hap it's been, it's been happening like this for, for a couple of thousand years, are these simple elements of bread and wine. And in the ritual of the, of the liturgy, they're, they're understood to be sacralized in a, in a particular way. Uh, ordinary elements of, of human life, bread and wine, somehow symbolically uh, made to uh, become uh, before our eyes uh, embodiments of the divine. And, and, and <coughs> that's the whole theology about the Eucharist. But here's the kind of funny thing. I, I, I look back on that now and wonder how I could have had that experience and developed a habit of dividing things up, matter and spirit, body and soul, heaven and earth, in a way that tended to uh, 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 value spirit and, and, and denigrate matter, value soul and, 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 and not value body as much as it should have been, uh, to, to, to think of heaven as the ultimate realm of This is an old story, by the way, in Christianity. I wasn't new to, you know, I didn't invent this. But you asked how it shifted, and I, it's, it's actually not that easy for me to say, except that I would say that I, I reached a certain point um, in my own intellectual, personal development where I started realizing on some level that I was starved for more contact with human body, the physical world. I, I had I had developed a kind of a spiritual practice and an idea of spiritual practice that was starving me. Mm -hmm. And so I don't think I was conscious of it, but it, but what I started to find myself doing is just I would just begin being drawn to get out into the world more, to have more contact. I started so I'm a theologian of sorts here. I teach in the theology <laughs> department and I I have my official card as a member of the Theological Guild. <laughs> and, uh, but I kind of I couldn't read theology anymore. I, I, I found I could only read poetry or evocations of essays that, that, that evoke the natural world. This began kind of a, I, I see now, a kind of a, an, a healing of my imagination mm -hmm. so that things began to be part of a whole again. Now, you can kind of judge for yourself. I don't, I think it's a pretty common story, actually, for, for, for many people, this kind of way of dividing up reality. And so what happened from that point is I began to find it increasingly possible to think of spirit apart from stuff. And I found it also difficult to behold the world And, and, and still on, on the contemplative side of things, and by the way, just the, the, the term contemplative ecology. Yes. You coined this, yes? We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anybody? Yeah. It, I, I just you know, want to focus in on you know, the right. fact that those two words coming together, um, it's practically, they're practically one word. You, you, know, you, you brought them uh, together uh, from that place of separateness. And, and coined this, this this amazing term and, and, uh, and it's powerful. It's it's, it's stirring the, the vision that, that it calls to mind. Um, and and yet, uh, and I'll, I'll just use you know my own prejudices here as as, as foil for, for the conversation. Um, the, isn't there a kind of like a stereotype you know to the contemplative life that it is a withdrawal from the world? And isn't there a lot of interpretation you know from the pulpit you know on Sunday mornings that. Uh, Oh, you shouldn't, uh, let us not get involved in the messy world of politics. We've got more, uh, bigger spiritual fish to fry. And, uh, <laughs> we, uh, you know, we, we, we've all heard this. Uh, and, uh, and the contemplative gesture that you, you called to mind, the, the monastic gesture of the fourth century, it, it did begin, did it not, with a withdrawal from yes. the populous Nile River Valley into the desert desert? 
Um, how does it become then, uh, how, does, how does that withdrawal ultimately, paradoxically, I suppose, ultimately mean a re-engagement with the world? Uh, work, work through that for us. <laughs> <laughs> you imagine week in and week out? <laughs> Ruben, for that penetrating question. <laughs> um, no, it's, well, first of all, all the things you've described in terms of, a, of an idea of contemplative life as removing oneself from the world, um, spiritual practice meaning not getting too involved in the messiness, this is all true. This has been, this has been a part, in the Christian tradition, it's been part of our, our, our legacy. at times to be reminded that there is some other dimension to our existence. And, and, and so let, let's not, um, let's not um, you know, forget that either. Um, so I, Ruben knows the story, but he's so helpful in just throwing me this nice question so I can tell this little story. So um, I, I just want to answer partly by way of asking everybody here a, a little question for you to think about. It's not a question that you have to answer out loud, although it'd be interesting to hear your response if you want to offer it. Um, withdrawal. Um, what strategies do you employ when you, you've kind of had it up to here, when, you, when, it, when it's, up, it's just all a little bit too much, just too much pressure, uh, the, 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 the anxiety is building, your friends can tell because you're really, you know, you're just tough to be around, you know, and um, and, there, and there needs to be some kind of reset or, or recalibration of, of your own self. And um, just ask you to consider for a moment what strategies you employ to kind of recenter yourself or to return to yourself. One of the classic spiritual practices is a kind of gesture of retreat, which came from the early monks. You, oh, you just, you get out of Dodge. You, you, you take off for the desert, or, 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 you, or, you, or you go on a retreat, as we would say now. The, the, the Jesuits, if you have any interest in this, will be happy to sign you up for an eight-day or a 30-day retreat. Father Greg, is that not true? Yes. <laughs> Father Greg's in the house, ladies and gentlemen. Let's let's just acknowledge and appreciate that. He's my dear friend. Thank you for coming, Greg. So, okay, so so this this intuition that in the midst of an otherwise deeply engaged life, maybe a life of, full of meaning and purpose and, and, and vitality and, and engagement with others, um, sometimes requires us to rediscover ourselves. And to, and, to, and to renew ourselves and replenish ourselves. Well, in the fourth century, the world was kind of coming undone around the, 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 the ears of, of ordinary men and women living in little villages in, in up and down the Nile Valley in Egypt. The Roman Empire was at its height. Uh, the Roman Empire, anybody who studied a little bit of history can tell you, I mean, uh, U.S. world domination in the late 20th, early 20th century kind of has nothing on, <laughs> you know, the Roman Empire in the, in the late. It, it, was, it was really empire, and it was brutal. And when they decided to uh, lower the boom on these towns and villages up and down the Nile Valley in terms of exacting every last uh, penny from people in, in terms of taxation and service, <coughs> it, it ended up sometimes uh, leaving people with no real choice but to evacuate or, or, to, or to remove themselves, to engage in what the, the, the monks called anachoresis. So this, this gesture of removing oneself, at least initially in this context, had a, it had a spiritual meaning, but it also had a political and economic and social meaning. And what people who saw the monks engaging in this act of withdrawal saw was not men and women rejecting life back in the village. They saw people engaging in an act of strategic withdrawal 
be imagined and be taught to the community. And what you see in the text and the stories from this time is that the monks, in fact, didn't really leave. They, they withdrew a little ways out of the desert, but the communities that they were originally a part of, they remained a part of, and they remained connected to, and they, they came to be seen as healers and as mediators and as people capable of standing in the midst of this terrible um, kind of duress that people were experiencing and, um, and helping to reimagine a, a world that was, that was whole. So withdrawal always involved a gesture of return. I mean, at least in this tradition it did. And, um, and I think that's still true today. I mean, uh, well, we could say more about examples of that in our own world. Taken vows or have withdrawn from a fray and have turned out to play a critical role in uh, reconstituting society. And um, that's interesting, isn't it? That you that you opt out in a, in a fashion and you become a key figure in helping reconstitute society. <coughs> Your friend, our poet in uh, Mexico City. Who you brought to campus last yeah, year? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Among others. Yes, of course. And well, and uh, I'm glad you you uh, bring him up, uh, the poet, the figure of the poet up, uh, because a, a lot of you look at a lot of art here and poetry in particular. Um, uh, so uh, and and it appears that for you that uh, art is um, the meeting ground between these these realms that have been forced apart. apart. Isn't that? Uh, the, your opening pages are with uh, Denise Levitov uh, uh, arriving in the Pacific Northwest, I guess in, in a kind of withdrawal from where she had been, right, in this journey across the, the, to, the, to the other coast, um, and, and things being revealed to her uh, in, in that journey. Uh, talk, talk to us about uh, the role of, of, of art in, in the book and, and then in your own process of, of bringing, uh, bringing this vision together. So I didn't grow up with this, and uh, is everybody okay back there? <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so a central question of this book, and it's become a central question for me, um, I'd be interested to know if it, if it, it has resonance for you, is um, the, the, the basic contemplative question, what does it mean to see? How do we learn to see? you learn to see anything? And it seems like kind of a silly question when you put it, I, I see things every day. I see my breakfast. I see my beloved. I see my children. I see the computer I'm working <coughs> on. See? You know? um, I think it becomes a poignant question when you start to consider how much sense you're seeing. How, how many of the subtle, important, crucial things So the, the contemplative is one who tries to deepen and cultivate a habit of regard for, for everything and everyone. And, um, and I can't really, again, explain how this happened, but at some point, well, actually, I know I, I remember when it happened the first time. It was completely by accident. I, um, I was, a, uh, as a youth, <laughs> finishing college, I saved up some money, and I went to see the world, and I hitchhiked across Europe, and I was on my way to Afghanistan, but somehow they never made it there. But anyway, I was in Paris, and I went to get my cholera shot to go to through um, what was then a much less um, kind of difficult Iran and Iraq and Afghanistan. And I, I came out of the um, doctor's office uh, having received this cholera shot, and I, I didn't really know what was happening, but I was basically hallucinating. Um, mm. You know, when they give you cholera shot, they give you a little bit of cholera just to kind of help you get used to the idea and then it, <laughs> and it 
deflects the, 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 the you know. But I, so I'm walking around Paris, and, you know, and, I, and, I, and I, I went into the Jeu de Palme, which was the museum at the time where all the Impressionist art was held, and was, was, was housed. And I, I hadn't really seen much art before in my life. I was in Paris. And so a little bit on a, on a hallucinogenic cholera-induced uh, um, high, I wandered around the Jeu de Palme, and I just... I, I had this kind of, I had this experience of just feeling the power of these paintings. And okay, you can say it was drug induced, that's fine. But, <laughs> but it, it was a moment for me of just kind of um, waking up to, the, to what could happen inside of us uh, gazing upon a great work of art. And um, it, that, that kind of delight and thrill. Visual art with film, with poetry. Poetry often, uh, Ruben is too much to say, say this. He's, he's, a, he's a great writer and a poet in his own right. And, and there's something about hearing good writing and poetry read aloud and kind of feeling yourself kind of mesmerized by it that it wakes you up a little bit to, to yourself and to the world. So art of all different kinds it has become just absolutely critical to me help in the work of deepening a, a, a contemplative practice. And um, I, I can't imagine, I, I can't imagine kind of living without it. So, and I think it's akin to what the monks were, were about. I just think it's, it's, it's similar, this open gaze. The monks, of course, believed they were gazing on the divine. Yeah. But there are many windows you can you know, gaze through to, to, to see that. Thank you for that. The, uh, uh, we should probably yes, have some. Yes. I, I, I just want to remark that I'm looking at every time I come up here, I, you know, I, I'm just drawn, talking about gazing, I'm just drawn to the windows because of the million dollar view. Actually, it's many, <laughs> much more than a million. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, uh, what is it? Uh, Sixty-eight million. <laughs> <laughs> drawn to it, and uh, you know, uh, you know uh, the class that, that you and I did, we, we brought the students up here for writing. How many professors have done writing exercises on the bluff? I mean, it's, it's, an, it's a pretty obvious thing to do because you have a great view. So you just, you know, tell the students, pen and paper, go out there, what do you see? But really see. you got to really see. So the type of scene that you're talking about just strikes me. I'm looking out there right now. I'm looking at this, this really crazy cold wind, cold spring wind. And uh, the, the light kind of like, you know, through the dust uh, slanting across the basin. And the beauty of the Santa Monica Mountains rising up on the other side of that basin. And I know it's San Gabriel's the Pacific Ocean. And the, and the, 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 the humanly inhabited part of this, this space. If you really start to see it in the way that you're talking about, that the, that the, that the artists have, have seen it and, and the contemplatives have seen it, how do we bear it? How do you bear the beauty of it? How do you bear the brokenness of it? The pain of that place? You know, it's, 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 it's enough to fill you to bursting. Um, it, uh, it, and, 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 and so, you are calling upon us to do this thing that could <laughs> could sometimes it feels like it could destroy us. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a very, it's a, it's, it's, it's a, it's, um, you're charging us with something, a massive, I mean, I'm thinking of the word in Spanish, imprescindible. Uh, Greg, imprescindible. How uh, uh, you from say imprescindible? Uh, uh, un, uh, we can't avoid it. It's a, it's a task that we must undertake, and yet if we do, it feels like we could lose it all. That's what the remarks are. No, no, I, I'll just say something briefly, and then it would be, and, and we've, we've been here like almost an hour, and that is just like, that is, that is true devotion and love. <laughs> <laughs> we, we appreciate it. Um, and there's more food, so then our hope is that, uh, you know, either, if you have to uh, scram, that's fine, but there's food and drink, and there's some nice Argentinian wine over there. Too. Well, I'll, I'll just say one thing, and this this may feel like a total downer, you know, <laughs> to kind of go here, but I, I, I have to say this. So, what you're saying about, you know, gazing upon the world is absolutely true. I, I, I'll just, just two little things that I'll comment on here. One is uh, kind of LA centric, and the other is um, is much more personal. But to cultivate a contemplative practice isn't just to kind of learn to groove on the 
so much beauty to behold and, and, to, and, and to take in and to be, to be enthralled with and to respond to. It's to behold everything. You know, and um, five years into my time here, um, uh, we met a man, uh, a great man called, named Carlos Boras, who was working at the time for a group called Community for a Better Environment. Carlos Porras, what his great work was, was to, among other things, was to help people see how fundamentally uh, kind of unjust uh, our, our uh, environmental practices in L.A. were. And he, he had this amazing map that he used to show, gosh, isn't this, isn't this sort of stunning to note that all along the Al Alameda Corridor, mostly uh, poor communities of color, has a disproportionate, a very highly disproportionate amount of toxic dumping <coughs> taking place in those communities. And, it, and the map would show this um, kind of uh, great blank spot, just empty of toxicity. And, and they corresponded almost perfectly to the class and economic divide in LA. So, and Carlos would take you on a little trip down the Alameda Corridor. I, I went a couple times, and we went with students, and um, it was really heartbreaking to sort of see to see that. And I didn't really want to see it. And I think nobody who goes on that trip ever really wants to see it. Carlos doesn't want to see it. But so seeing it and his invitation to see it and to be moved by it and to become involved and responsive to it, that's a moral invitation to see in a way that might, as you're saying, uh, sort of uh, break your heart, but it's it's part of the, 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 the call, I think. And the other thing I'll just say, uh, it's very important to me, but it, 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 and it made its way into this book in a way that I, I didn't expect, which was that while I was writing the book, my mother contracted cancer. She mercifully saw the cancer go into remission three different times, and finally it didn't go into remission any longer, and I, I, I write about the experience of uh, sitting with my father and my mother at the kitchen table, watching her uh, uh, run her hand through her scalp, kind of in the way that you do without thinking, and out came a clump of hair. And that was the first time I had seen palpable evidence of what was happening inside her body, the chemotherapy, the effects of it, and what was eventually going to kill her. And I was aware at the time that I didn't really want to look. I, I didn't want to see that. I, I, I wanted to look away. And probably a lot of us have experienced that, you know. And so I guess a big challenge for me in that whole experience of accompanying her she died was somehow learning to have the courage to really look and, and to behold her. And, and maybe in some way that I can't even begin to put language to find beauty in what I was beholding uh, even in that um, space. So I, I completely agree with you and I don't have some great thing to say about how you do it, but I think it's important to open yeah, yourself. Did. places that are dark and go to sleep. Yeah. Um, and so just realizing that it's like if you don't 
that's not something that our culture, you know, that this is not normal. Right, right. Well, by the way, lest you be under any illusion <laughs> about what that must be like, um, so here's um, Exhibit A. Where's Exhibit B? <laughs> 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 yeah. So just take a good look at Bennett, look at his brother, uh, think of their two twin sisters, uh, think of my eldest, Julia, and think of them all crammed into this tiny little space, and, um, and then just kind of close your eyes and, and imagine <laughs> contemplative time. <laughs> so so I, I do think longer periods are valuable. I mean, Ignatius has this idea of a 30-day retreat, which I've never made one. I think I'm a little bit scared to make one, even though I love to hang out with the Trappists who, you know, have their own devotion to silence, um, or an eight-day retreat. Um, but, you know, Ignatius also helps us kind of feel the simple beauty of doing an examine daily. <coughs> this kind of checking in that is meant to become part of a rhythm of living, and if your vocation is eventually to have a family or to live in a, in a, in a, in a kind of stressful, complicated working environment, and it, it still would be great to be able to take time apart, but that's not always going to be so easily accessible. And the, the art of all this, as far as I can tell from all the great teachers, is to eventually learn to inhabit it in, in, in the dailiness of your, of your living. And um, that can be helped by longer stretches apart, absolutely. But I think sometimes we make the mistake of saying, you know, I can never find a time to do that, so I can never really do that, so I can never really practice it. So you get caught in another loop that isn't so helpful. Here's exhibit B. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I can I just, I, I'll just put a question to anyone who, I, I'd love to hear a response to any of you who, to ask you, like, you're inhabiting this same world in, in the year 2000. And it's not just what happened in Boston yesterday. It's 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 this kind of slow, hidden, you know, erosion of the fabric of of the living world, and, and we're all kind of aware of it. And nobody can do anything about it. So you <coughs> carry on as well as you can. But there it is, and it's the world we're all going to live into. One way or another, and I, I guess I'm, I'm just kind of interested to know whether that's that's a concern for you, and whether that shows up in your own, you know, thinking about about your life, you know, your 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 own, you know, hugely significant singular life, part of your the concern to you, and if so, how does it show up? In Yes. To answer that question, it makes me go to the God that I serve. And in doing that, um, I ask myself, am I dissatisfied or satisfied with what I read, what I believe, and what I know to be true, that I'm not going to be here for it? And things will happen. And I was just wondering, as a professor of theology, how much has satisfaction or dissatisfaction played a part in your quest for spirituality? And how does it, how do the two mix? God that you serve. Well, I mean, I, I think one way of answering that is to say, like, why, why does anybody find themselves drawn to make a conscious choice to follow a spiritual practice, whether that is something you grow up with a particular communal spiritual practice, joining with others on a weekly basis, or if you're drawn
drawn to, to give your own attention over to a meditative or prayer practice. I mean, that can arise out of gratitude, and it often does arise out of gratitude. I think for many of us, it arises out of some sense of dis-ease in us. Mr. Fedora guy, hold on. Take your food away, because I have a question for you. <laughs> <laughs> You're sitting here so nicely, but you didn't know I was just going to ask you a question. But sort of the, sort of the, <coughs> the unease that, that can fuel or lead to a sense that one has to find something more than, 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 than the, the, the center around, what, around which one is living now. So I, I don't want to make a grand statement of that, that it is dis-ease or unease or dissatisfaction, but I think that that often is a seed that leads someone to feel like, I want to go deeper. I want to be more connected. I want to be, I want to feel myself capable of loving and being loved and being part of a community. And so I think it can really be a very, it can generate a lot of uh, positive uh, kind of uh, constructive response, even though it starts from a place of say, dissatisfaction. Didn't mean to put you on the spot, but I've just been admiring your fedora. You know, is it a fedora? Um, it's full of Basque entries. Uh, it's a Basque, Basque hat. country hat. <laughs> <laughs> may, may I ask your name? Kevin. Kevin. And are you guys here together? Oh uh, yeah. And you are? Luke. Luke. I'm Caleb. Caleb. Kevin, Luke, and Caleb. And I'm not even going to ask you why you're here, or if there's extra credit on the line, or if you just. There's beer. You knew there was going to be beer. <laughs> or you are so interested in contemplative ecology. I'm not going to ask you that. But so, but you're, you're sitting here in the front row. You've been great, uh, and, and, and you know, tuning in to everything. I'd, I'd just be interested to hear three college guys. I don't know what year you are. Two juniors. Okay, three juniors here at LMU. Lions, mighty lions. Tell me something about wh what this has to do with your life, if, if, if anything. Any, 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 any of you guys? I'm trying okay. to find that blue sapphire. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I guess just the, the first thing that comes to mind when you're talking about the contemplative ecology and the times that you take for these restorative retreats and things is, well, I started out as an English major here, and so obviously the most surface level and common example I can think of is Kim Turner Abbey, I guess. And that's something that I think sort of addresses what, I don't know her name, but she was talking about earlier, is the inability to maybe take physical retreats as regularly as needed. And I think that you can possibly, if you have had a physical experience at one point and engaged in it on a deep enough level and have internalized that, then you can sort of return to that sort of thing in more of a meditative <coughs> state. And I think that he says that he finds a lot of peace thinking back to Tintern Abbey and the, or the, the ruins of Tintern Abbey, I guess, and remembering that. And that's <coughs> And I definitely feel the same way that you do. I'm from Oregon, not Los Angeles, so we have a lot more nature up there. So when you talk about sort of the natural world, or uh, were you saying the living world sort of coming apart like subtly underneath us, a lot of times I go home and I find that somewhat hard to believe because people talk about overpopulation and things like that. And even in the United States, you look at the density of the population and in the Midwest where Luke is from and in Oregon, the Pacific Northwest where I'm from, we have vast stretches of nothing. And so it's really easy for me to go back there or think of other places in even just the U.S. where we have great stretches of wilderness and that there is some in California I find to be hopeful. Um, but yeah, so I definitely identify with that and sort of the restorative feelings and everything that uh, you get from that. I definitely connect with that. Thank you. You guys, any, any, you're, you're, you're after the blue sapphire. <laughs> Seriously? Well, I'm, uh, been involved in some withdrawal. I've done uh, two months in the Elks Mountain Range in Colorado. Wow. And that's, you know, when you talk about a return to yourself, I mean, it comes down to we did, um, we all went out together in a group of like 12 guys. And then from there, once we made it into the wilderness, say maybe three weeks, we did a solo. It's three days, no human 
when I first came here, I kind of I didn't know if this would be more of like a I didn't know if you had more of a science background because I saw like college you, right? So I didn't know if like this was kind of a cross between like science and humanities. Um, but I thought it was really cool. Uh, cause I, I I come from like a Jesuit background, so a lot of this just makes sense to me. And like I've heard all this before, and it just sounds like this like, stuff I've done like these uh, long amounts of, like good amount of retreats. Not I mean nothing as extreme as that, but still. Uh, maybe a week at a time or so, so, I don't know, it's just really interesting uh, hearing about that and uh, your perspective on it, also. Thank you guys for being Dan. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm wondering whether we need to think about wrapping up, Jamie, is that? Is that I think that it's, it, I mean, we've got the room. Okay, the, but I, I, party, so maybe, so maybe, a, maybe a couple more questions. I just don't want to... But don't to our collective um, audience, too, if there are people who have yeah, to yeah, leave yeah, to yeah, get yeah, somewhere. Yeah, we need to leave, but, but there, there is more food and drink, and that is part of why we came here after all. So come on. <laughs> we are um, celebrating. So, <laughs> so maybe, maybe another comment or question, or, or, and, and then you know, we can... Um, okay, I, I admit that I, too, read that same passage out loud. Um, and the raft of pelicans have stayed with me. I think that um, this Rilke or Hopkins will take us with the wind hover or with the circling around God. That your labor of love um, has given us a raft um, to enter into and come back out of in any way, fashion, wreckage within us, around us, and to be aware of that song that continues to be sung of someone, of some love, loving the creation, and it's a lament as, as well as a love song, and I'm very grateful for all your deep listening and how it comes out in the music of that book. And I will probably take the longest to read your book because I read slowly, I often read out loud, and then I go back and read your, um, who you thank, because I feel like that's the call and response for people like yourself and you who have been woven into this labor of love. And um, I'm grateful for the gratitude that you both carry. to mention that um, the last uh, two classes I've had here at LMU, I'm in your second one now, and they're of completely different areas. One was in biology and one's this one I'm in is in theater, uh, are talking about the same thing, about their con there's a concern of people really not being in touch. Um, and becoming um, to have superficial lives and not considering the space we live in and the earth and our connection to it. And I've seen so many articles coming out now and I go to some classes at Shambhala Center and they talk about kitchen sink dharma, just washing your dishes as a way to, to co contemplate. Uh, my theater teacher talks about reading as going to your temple, just to sort of ground yourself. And uh, I just wanted to commend you on your book because I haven't read it yet, but it seems to take all of that and um, solidify it in, in a way. So I'm looking forward to reading it. And thank you for all your hard work. Let's congratulate uh, Douglas.